Hi, thanks for joining us today uh, with the Cybersecurity Collaborative. Uh, wants to present uh, 2023 CISO priorities. Uh, we have a great panel today, people I've known for a long time that have a lot of experience in this field. Um, first off, we have Richard Rushing. Uh, he is the <clears throat> Chief Security Officer for Motorola Mobility. Uh, he speaks uh, internationally at many different conferences. Uh, next, we have Renee Goodman Stark. Uh, Renee has started uh, the CISO role in several organizations. She's been the CISO for Royal Caribbean, Coca Cola, Time Warner, uh, and uh, has been a transformational CISO and now has her own business of, is a C CEO and founder of uh, CISO Hive LLC. Welcome, Renee. Uh, and next we have uh, Roland Cloutier. Uh, Roland uh, is the was the uh, former global chief security officer for TikTok. Uh, he was also the global uh, security officer for EMC, ADP, uh, several other organizations, uh, and has served in the U.S. Air Force uh, working on security issues. Welcome, Thank Roland. You. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, we have Rylan Kazantian. Uh, Ryan is with our sponsor, uh, Wiz. Uh, and Ryan has uh, had previous experience with Meta as a security engineering lead, uh, working on the WhatsApp uh, Messenger applications. Uh, he was also a technical director for Mandiant uh, and was also previously the CTO of Tanium. Uh, so we have an extremely experienced panel today. Uh, I am Todd Fitzgerald. Uh, I am the host of the uh, podcast, which we have over 100 episodes now, called CISO Stories, uh, which evolved out of the uh, book that I wrote a few years ago called uh, CISO Compass, uh, which both Renee uh, and Roland uh, contributed to. Uh, the Cybersecurity Collaborative is an organization where we bring CISOs together to work on problems uh, that are advising other CISOs and their teams uh, to help us all with our security efforts. So with that introduction, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about 2023. Uh, you know, we've had challenging years. Uh, we've had, the, it seems like the security threat just gets uh, greater and greater as we move on. Uh, and we want to talk about what are those key differentiating issues uh, this year that, that we should be focusing on in our programs. And as you're listening to this, you might think about, you know, how do I incorporate these ideas into my own presentations, to my own company, to the board, because you're learning uh, from some very experienced people uh, that are seeing a lot of things within this field. So first off, let's get started with uh, Roland. Uh, why don't you kick us off here and give us your thoughts about data defense. Uh, we're in this international regulatory environment uh, with increasing complexity today. Uh, security is not a localized issue. And how do, we, how do we address data defense and minimize the downside risk of data access in ever increasing data stores uh, while keeping in compliance with these privacy and security laws and supporting our privacy uh, officers globally. Uh, thanks, Todd, and, and thanks for having me. I think, uh, you know, I always love the beginning of the year as we talk about the things that uh, we're all going to be focusing on most over this year. And, you know, and and, and when we were discussing this previously, uh, you know, I you know immediately said, hey, data defense and access assurance is something we have to talk about. And um, from, you know, from where, where I've, I sit and where I've sat for the last um, two or three years has has been such an immense focus on uh, global national requirements around independent jurisdictions to protect data in very different ways. Um, my, you know, my guess is that this isn't just a 2023 thing. Um, I, I believe uh, deep, you know, kind of inside that this will be something we'll be working on for the next you know, two, three, four years where it will become, you know, up to a third of our job uh, around ensuring access to information is protected, compliance with these global laws um, and ensuring the, uh, you know, organizations are able uh, to prove their capability to operate within certain geos. 
That being said, um, it, it takes partnership. At the end of the day, this takes an amazing partnership. In many organizations, the, the CPOs or CDOs, uh, chief privacy officers and, and chief data officers um, are just an, an amazing uh, amount of knowledge and understanding of what these laws really mean, their, their implications, their, their, their true requirements. Um, but they don't operationally implement necessarily enterprise scalable controls um, that you know can ensure some of the basic things that these are asking about. Where's my data? Who has or where's my citizen data? Who has access to it? Where has it gone? Um, and what's the current status of it? These are really basic things that governments are starting to ask about consumer type data, not just PII or not just PHI or not just specific areas but about information specific to their citizens. And it's not just critical infrastructure banking or, or you, know, um, you, know, uh, you know, social media. It, it, is, it is literally anyone that does business with an individual in any given country. And, and so we're gonna have to take a step back and really think about that. Um, our jobs will, will be to ensure from the time that information is brought in, the time that it leaves or is destroyed outside your company, that you have total accountability end to end. And there are there are many things that it takes to, to do that. And, you know, we, we think about data lakes and we think about, you know, containers shifting information with containers. And we think about, um, you know, generalized application to application access to data, very different than make sure Jimmy and Sally, you know, can't get that because it's not in their division. We're going, we're going to have to get to that level and prepare our organizations. And there'll be a few things to get us there. I think first and foremost is transparency into your environment, knowing where my data is, what type of data is it, how do you store it, tag it, understand what's there, and be able to do that at a very scalable level. I think uh, instrumentation of controls, um, co controls at the application level, at the data store level. Um, and even at the container to container, uh, container to container level, it's not just about encryption, and it's not just about um, uh, access by people. It's it's truly going to be how does it traverse in my environment, in, 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 including by jurisdiction. If we think about um, certain laws that, that talk about uh, you know data localization and, and things of that requirement, we're, we're going to have to build infrastructure operations and analysts that are able to do that. And so I think there's that's, that's a starting point is start getting a plan together this year. What type of data do we have? What jurisdictions is this gonna be important to? How long do we have to do this? What's the long tail to be able to implement this type of scalable capability? And then um, last but not least, how do I start training my workforce uh, to be ready for it and, and, and putting those new job skills into my job family and start budgeting for those technologies. And, and lastly, how do I partner with my CPO to understand what they need, what they expect of me and how to partner together? And this is a big culture shift with all the different things like the Digital Services Act that we have in, in Europe and the NIS directive that's coming out and Brazil is, is having its own um, laws that, that are being put in place. Um, so, you know, so, so how do we address that, that culture uh, aspect? And, and, and I'll open that up. And, and as we're discussing here, if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, window and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. Yeah, regarding culture, one thing I'll call out is, um, especially for companies that are building and shipping software that um, is affected by the, the international regulatory environment that you're describing, um, there's an unrealistic level of tax that's being put on development teams, product teams, if they are expected to independently design and develop for uh, security requirements, for compliance requirements, and then as a subdomain of that for privacy requirements. Um, and unfortunately, each of those functions in most organizations is built in a fairly siloed manner. Privacy, I would say, being the, the newest of these disciplines in that, especially in larger orgs, like you started with privacy legal, now you're starting to see dedicated domains for privacy engineering, privacy risk and compliance, um, which is great. But if all three of them are bombarding teams with their own separate threads of design guidance, development guidance, control track checks, pre-shipping reviews, nothing will get done. Um, and so I think what I've started to see is that um, each of those teams has expectations, processes and controls that actually overlap more than they don't. Engineering for security against a determined adversary 
is not the same thing as securing uh, as privacy engineering, but there is a lot of overlap. There are a lot of the same design considerations. There are a lot of controls that impact both domains. Um, and the receiving end of that, the product and engineering teams that need to meet those needs, really can appreciate when these teams work together and consolidate their flows. And so for organizations that have just through fast iteration started to build up these functional silos, I think it really behooves them to think about combining and consolidating workflows, getting that feedback from the engineering teams and infrastructure teams that are on the receiving end of these guidance and requirements. And just thinking about how it can be done in a more efficient and consistent manner. Um, I think that'll improve compliance and adherence with all these different frameworks and controls across the board. Yeah, no, I think you, there's a couple of cultural aspects of this that are actually pretty interesting. One is the geographical boundaries and everything else. It's no longer one size fits all. It is where, how are we going to do this? Is it a cookie cutter that we replicate what we did in the US, we replicate in Europe, what we do in that Asia or not? Maybe it's time to rethink it and go, well, if I'm actually going to build something perhaps in Brazil, maybe the suppliers and everything else that I use there are much different than what I use in North America. And there's nothing to say that's wrong. One of the biggest, I always used to say that we don't have issues in protecting privacy data. In other words, what we have issues with is how we use privacy data. But that's where the rubber hits the road is like, I can store it and I can keep it safe. But the second I need to give access to people, like Roland pointed out, that's a whole different story at that point in time. And you really have to really start thinking about that because now before it was OK, there was issues, but it wasn't that now there's regulatory fines and everything else that are going to come of this. And those are going to be painful. We've already seen this from the EU this year and everything else. It's a painful, big sets of fines that are hitting organizations uh, time and time again, and they're not going to get lower. They're not going to get cheaper on that, uh, so, on that so, side of it. So, Richard, are, are the fines having an impact or are companies looking at that and saying, they're, well, they're, that, they're, it looks they're, like a big fine, but it's not really? It depends on the amount and the number of records and everything else. But as you start seeing this, you're going to start getting in this. This is the second time this has happened. This is the third time. And those are going to be up there. But people are now understanding. You kind of, I don't want to say this is a, you kind of had a start with the GDPR process, but then you had a bunch of people that kind of said, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we've got this. But now it's like now we're dealing with access and where this data resides and who has access and what kind of citizens are required. To, the complexity is now creeped up. So a lot of the controls, everybody said, OK, we're done. You're not done. You're far from done uh, on that side of it. But the issue is, if you don't start, you're never going to be done. The second thing is, each time you do this, it's a replication. In other words, the controls that I use to control access to these systems, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in China, whether it be in North America, should be something that's harmonized so that I can come up with standards, the minimum viable security levels and things around that, that I can replicate easily across the board instead of having to reinvent this first, second, and third. And as, 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 as Roland and pointed out, um, and as well, is that you always end up with it's going to get worse. This is not a 2023 problem because there'll be seven more countries that are going to require the same function in 2024. So if you didn't start, guess what? You're now from went 10 plus seven. Oh, now we're 17. Uh, what number is your magic number that you want to get into? And I think that's one of the keys that this is going to hurt if you're not careful with that because there will be either your chief privacy officer, your chief data officer is going to be like, we don't have the controls. We don't have the thing. We should not be doing this because of the regulatory issues with that. Or the data has to stay in country, period. And so you end up with, now I have, instead of one giant data lake, I have seven giant data lakes that can't talk together. And so there's costs that are going to be associated with that, that if you're not budgeted for seven data lakes, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, or you need to find a better solution than just throwing everything into a data lake. Absolutely. R Renee, how do we get our arms around this? Yeah, so thank you. Um, I've been actually looking at privacy for almost, you know, 20 plus years, I think before, you know, people even spoke about it. 
And on some level, I feel like the laws themselves haven't changed. I mean, the same kind of principles around it, you know, just knowing the transparency. And um, so the laws themselves, I, I think, evolve, but I don't think they're fundamentally different. What I think is different, though, in the past, we would have tried to solve some of this through questionnaires and bringing in teams of people to go pester our, our business users to ask them what they were doing. And then we thought we would maybe, I think, draw some flow charts and figure out what the data mapping looked like. And so I'm actually in New York at a meeting with about 100 um, CISOs and um, various people, as well as some founders of companies. And the thing that I find the most encouraging is that they're really founders and you know people that um, actually understand this problem are building what I'm going to call better approaches to how we're going to address this in the future around data mapping. Who has access? Where is my data? If it's in the cloud, you know, what is it? Where is it? Who's accessed it? And there's some other advantages too, like the fact that that you would even know if if you know nobody's been touching a data repository and if that's the case maybe you can get rid of it and save some money on some storage so i'm going to take um you know i think privacy in and of itself is a fundamental truth um i believe in it um, maybe because i come from another country but i do and i just believe that now we're better um, some of the technology and some of the learnings that we've had over the past years will enable us to be better prepared and and i would hope that we would do it in such a way that would be collaborative with our business and where we are not just adding more friction into the system so that would be my hope for how we go about thinking about this as a, as opposed to just seeing it as more doom and doom do you, do you think in the United States that we'll get to a some sort of homogenized federal law around privacy or or will we look like the rest of the world that will have all these different laws and and not take those learnings from GDPR where you know the directive uh, you know had its had its laws because each country was then able to go off and, and decide how they interpreted that. Well, remember, yeah, that's we're, a good we're, we're question, we're, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you think about it. You know, how many years have we seen the same question about cyber laws? Is there going to be one overarching, you know, cyber laws? Is there going to be one overarching uh, criminal law on X? I, I just don't see the United States getting to a single privacy um, uh, law. Will, will the federal government have an appropriate privacy um, law that covers? multiple industries, all jurisdictions, of course. I think there'll be one consistent one that, you know, can be levied, levied across uh, the world. But, you know, you're still going to see states taking um, their uh, their initiatives uh, to protect the interests of uh, their constituents and their citizens and their states as a republic to, to um, push forward. I mean, you've seen change in the industry, like in the financial sector with, um, you know, New York final, uh, financial data law, right? You, you see that in California on privacy that pushed the country forward. You've seen this in a bunch of different areas. I don't think that'll ever change. I think as executives in commercial entities, in, in even, even SESs in government agencies, we, we are going to have to deal um, with uh, different laws by jurisdiction, even within uh, sovereign countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so let, let's move on to our next topic here. So, as we've talked about how we have this global environment that we're operating in with this interconnectedness, um, we we've had you know issues with supply chain with with software uh, over the last few years. Uh, we we recently did a uh, CISO stories podcast uh, with the CISO from SolarWinds, uh, walking through what happened. Uh, in that breach, how they've mitigated things since the breach. Um, so we're, we're talking about global resiliency and in the incident response and, and being able to respond to that on a global basis. Um, so Richard, what sort of what sort of things have we learned? We just had this, you know, global incident, if you will, the, the pandemic that we've that we've you know that that we're we're still, you know, isn't, isn't completely <laughs> over yet, right? Um, but but we seem a lot of people we seem to feel like it is. Um, so how do we how do we respond uh, globally as we're becoming more and more connected with each other? Richard, you want to kick us no, off? Yeah, 
Um, no, I think it's it's an interesting area, um, and we give our we we're far more resilient than uh, we give ourselves credit for. A lot of times, our resiliency is just coming out of hard situation, figure out the problem at the other end, and figure out the solution. We're really good at that. Um, and we, we kind of step forward. It takes some time, but that's part of the issue that's going to come in is that I think as we get interconnected and everything else, there's going to be two sides of the equation. You, you even see it now where places are banning software. And it's like everybody is thinking about this as something new. I'm like, this is nothing new. Corporations banned people's software of not allowing things to be on that. So it's no different. It's up to what was the intent of that and the reasons why but i don't think everybody's going to make a decision and it's going to be on either one side to one side of it or the other side and everybody's kind of trying to fit in the middle for a lot of this but those are the reactions some of them are knee-jerk some of them are i i i don't have protection i can't do protection i, ne I need to do other things and so I think it's one of those things, as we always talk about in, in security, that defense in depth approach. And I th really think that that is where we start having things is that everything's in layers. And you may have, a, a the, just like you have the network security layer, you've got all these other stuff. You can talk a little about OSI model, you can go up to the application. You, you're gonna have privacy layers now. You're gonna have these things that need to be on these things that you have to overlap. And looking at that, Otherwise, how many applications do you have in your in, in the support for the organization on that side of it? Is it hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? Well, if you start doing that, each one of those is going to have, need to be reviewed depending on its data, depending on what's going on. And if you're doing that, you will you will kill your team. Uh, literally, it will come to a standstill because that's all that I can do. Uh, so you really have to get and work together with the different groups. It does me no good to send questionnaires to uh, an operator and have them fill them out and then send them back to me when they're in the same organization. That's a meeting thing. So give me a, let me understand what you're doing. Let me have this communication back. A lot of those things that we do that we've kind of done is like fill this out. Do you have this? Yes or no? We're 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 doing this and the. The tooling and everything else is caught up. I can do auto discover. I can find things. I can go. Those are coming along, but it's the same thing. There is not one solution that's going to fit it. And there's not what might, works for my organization will be able to work in your organization mm -hmm. without changes. And I think that's the thing. But it is getting that ground level, understanding the challenges, trying to find people that have solved the challenge. And then seeing if that can be brought into your organization or great ideas, but I need a couple of more things and it would be perfect using that. So I think from a perspective of how you do this is you got to work with your organization, reach out to people and organizations and find out what's there because there is the people that have been doing this already for three to four years. You can learn a lot from those types of things versus the other ones. I'm just starting this and I need to I need to know how to get started on that side. And I think those are the key areas that if you try to do it on your own, you're just going to reinvent wheels mm -hmm. multiple sets of times. And, and that's Roland, not a real you, benefit. Roland, do you have a silver bullet for this? I, I don't know if it's a sil silver bullet, Todd, but I can say from operational experience, um, you know, what Rich was talking about, it, you know, is a reality. It, you're you're your large digital ecosystem that has become your business um, is is very vast and wide. And 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 often we've been running down this hard path of uh, protecting, migrating, enabling cloud, doing doing the things we've had to do as, as the business and technologies have, have really increased. I mean, think of the work we've had to do in cloud over two or three years. And all of a sudden, that portion of your business that does this widget is actually not even in our, our is not our managed technology or service it's it's from a third party within your service chain so i would say you could probably do three things the first is go back and do a value chain risk assessment just just go back sit down with your businesses and your 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 teams that do business resilience or bcp probably have this where you can actually say 
you know, in order when we imagine a product, when we build a product, when we pre-sell, when we sell, when we, you know, support a project, when we monetize our, a, pro a product to monetize it, it looks like this. And here's the systems or services underneath that does it. That'll give you a really good understanding of, you know, what it is. But sometimes your PIAs have that. Sometimes your BIAs have that. Whoever has it, sit down, validate it. So the so your teams can understand it. And it's not just about looking for risk. It's about understanding where you can implement controls or not. And what's your responsibility or not? So can I do incident response? This was a dis kind of a discussion topic or area before around incident response. Um, so do that work, sit down with your business, find out who these partners are, and then establish relationships. I think that's number one. Number two is, um, We've, we all have run books. We know what happens when data center one has a malware outbreak. We know when, you know, our container environment has negative code implemented it. We all have run books, add run books for these extraneous parts of your ecosystem. If partner Y has a problem, here's what I do. Here's who I call. Just make it a part of your process to ensure that they, they are part of whatever process it is. And the, and, the, and the third thing I would say that is most impactful is for those that you have good relationships with and are willing to work with you, do table op IRs with them. Um, you know, this was very successful in my last couple of companies and I, I know organizations doing this all the time where they have a big provider um, and that provider sits down and, and they say, okay, let's, let's do an IR together. And, and um, you know, give that, give your team a, you know, a running chance <laughs> Uh, to not have done it for the first time when they see it for the first time, if you know what I mean. Like, it's always better to have practice with those you're going to have to respond with um, rather than invent it on the way. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to second that, uh, Roland, only because I think that's so important. I've heard that, you know, the airlines now do shared tabletops because they're actually running on shared infrastructure, the airport, things of that nature. Number two, a lot of companies now have managed service providers, right? Running maybe parts of their operations. And I think it's really important to be inclusive, as you said, with the people that are gonna be in the boat with you during the incident, that you actually include them into your tabletop as well. Uh, the only other thing that occurs to me, and this is more of a conversation with the business, is that, you know, um, there was a company in a, a I don't know how to anonymize this, but you know, more or less they made timekeeping software and, and they were a provider to a lot of companies. And so they had a problem. The, the issue is that um, most companies no longer can do manual timesheets. And so I guess it comes down to, are there some processes in your business that maybe deserve um, you know, a second thought, you know, in terms of what you would do with the event of an outage, do you send people home? I mean, those are the kinds of things that perhaps, and I'm not, and if you know it's not going to happen often, maybe it's no big deal, but at least maybe talk about it. Because I think that we're so reliant now on systems outside of um, our own data centers. So things that we don't fundamentally control. And um, we're going to think, have to think broader about what it's you know what could happen if some of those suppliers or those providers aren't available um, to you and, and maybe factor that into your business planning yeah I, I I think it's it's an interesting it's an interesting topic because what we've seen in the last year and a half is so many of our businesses have concentrated their trust in it a handful of very strategic service providers uh, for identity and authentication for CI CD for source control, for telephony and communications um, and messaging. Um, I'm not going to name any names here. Everyone knows top of mind all the companies in the spaces I just identified that got breached in the past year badly, leading to very painful incident response processes for all of the companies that depended on them down the line. Um, again, not the least of which to mention CICD in just the past week. Um, so what does that mean? Like for an organization, like it is always certainly better for them to depend on some of these services than to try to home grow their own authentication stack or to self host their own um, build infrastructure or to self host their own, um, like the, the classic one is email, like never run your own exchange server. No one should be running. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not trying to argue that we, we, we made things worse off, but we haven't yet figured out 
well, what do I do when my authentication and authorization provider that I've now hooked every application in my entire stack to has been compromised? And how do I respond to that? Um, and so, yes, it's a tabletop exercise, but it's also a rethinking of, of the threat models and of the break glass scenarios that companies need. And it's probably going to be five to 10 years before we figure this out because we adopted these solutions and they gained market traction and dominance faster than we could have ever expected. And like COVID accelerated this because the need for remote work was like just throwing fuel on the fire of like shifting dependency to these services. Um, yeah, so now we're in this interesting position and um, it's going to take a lot of work to unwind how these these past year's worth of incidents and I'm sure what to come will mean in terms of, all right, how do I make sure these core functions, source control authentication, my build infrastructure, um, are recoverable in the event, the inevitable event that the, the service provider will be breached again or will go down again. Um, yeah. That's yeah. something we're just learning. Now, we're, we've seen this time and time again in 2023 where outages have affected a vast majority of pieces of people's infrastructure that's there. So even some of those basics of, hey, authentication went down, well, send people home at this point in time uh, in, in some of those cases. Uh, and I think those are the those are the issues that a supplier went down. Uh, when the ransomware was doing massive outbreaks, shipping companies were hugely impacted. So anybody that was doing shipping internationally, well, this is a supplier and you focused in and we're really good at going, we only want one vendor, we only want one vendor and that's great. But again, when you only have one vendor and that vendor is no longer able to do their job for whatever reason, um, you're stuck. Uh, and that could be a significant issue and and it can come in different ways. It could come from a network outage. It could come from any of these different possibilities that may not equal compromise, but equals I don't have a service. What is my what do I fall back to? And some of these there is no fallback. Uh, and I think that's where we've kind of ran down this road a little bit. And this is some of the initiatives in the EU resiliency and everything else. We see a lot of critical infrastructure doesn't have backup. We see a lot of this is just kind of the way we kind of hurried and did things during COVID and everything else. And and those are things that we're going to have to go back and fix uh, because they're just going to keep they, to the point of when one breaks, it will get fixed the next time before that. So, so, so as we look at this, uh, you know, we're now we've added all this complexity. We've moved things out. We've moved things into different environments. Now we layer on top of that. One of the reasons that that we moved this this direction was because of the lack of skills and the difficulty in getting all these different skill sets. And now, as we look at things like AI, machine learning. Uh, you know, different uh, technologies that we need these skill sets. Um, how do we how do we accommodate that? Uh, Renee, uh, you want to give us your thoughts on that? Sure. <clears throat> so I think that when we all took these careers, we had to sign up to be lifelong learners because of things that, you know, were in place when I started a long time ago. You know, we don't even do them anymore. I don't even know if we even talk about them. So that, that's number one. We, we ourselves have to have an attitude that we're just going to be constantly learning and we have to make sure that the people that we work with in our partners feel the same way. So some of it starts with attitude. We can't be afraid of innovation. Um, secondly, we have to also look where the, the puck is going. And so I just was looking at a study that said that um, it was an MIT study that said that 78% of CIOs are going to scale up their AI efforts by 2025 and 72%, you know, are considering multi-cloud. So we have no choice but to look at, you know, we need to be able to provide risk advice, all right, in these scenarios to our businesses. And I think that's really going to be increasingly our role. And whether our own teams can do it or whether we have to find really great partners um, that we can work with, we're just going to have to find a way to be there. And I think companies will have to approach, will approach it differently. I think the larger companies will probably tool up inside. They'll have, you know, the AI, the ML specialty uh, groups. They'll have, um, you know, they'll be able to, I think, afford and attract the talent. I, I think it'll be harder for others. 
So I'll, I'll come back. I think there's a growing need for uh, services um, that, that will bring this type of talent to organization at some reasonable fee. Okay. Um, I think this is also why we have to continue to partner in terms of um, the ISACs, you know, how we, how we exchange information so that we're constantly uplifting each other and we're not having to reinvent every wheel within our own shop. So we have to be effective as well in terms of how we, we collect this kind of information. Um, you know, I, I think there are, there are things, though, that we'll want to probably look at internally. We'll want people to understand the processes of our business. We probably want people in our shops that will help our developers to be more agile, this whole shift left movement. So I think there are things that we might keep internally. But otherwise, other than that, I think we're going to have to find some expertise um, because I don't think it's going away. Um, and by the way... I I, I, you know, the other thing I have to tell you, I decided that I had to go see what this new technology was. I thought, well, how many YouTube videos can I find on this thing? And I probably found 10 of them. And I thought, you know what? If 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 push came to shove, I would probably prepare myself for a meeting by go, go watching a YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're starting to see uh, progressive organizations, Todd, look at uh, mechanisms to ensure that they're – their people skills are not just looked at once every couple of years or their job families with HR or three or four years, whatever the normal pace is, but they essentially have um, employee engagement and, uh, and employee success people. I mean, this started with Amazon and, and other like companies. Um, and so I'm, it, it's impressive to watch where this has gone, but I think that's a real thing. I think chief security officers, especially in larger companies, um, are going to have to focus FTE to look at how their um, their mission is changing, what those job functions are going to be, and how they're going to consume and get those. And and like other organizations are doing real great jobs working with higher education, looking at a five to ten year pipeline of people through university systems, certificate programs, um, uh, you know, returning military, and so on and so forth. So it, it it's like a full time job. Um, and I would what I would add on to what Renee said is is that um, it's going to take different types of people. We're not going to have firewall engineer one on ones anymore, right? We're you know we're we're already getting at that edge with cloud engineers, right? Are, are they cloud engineers? Or are they specific? Are are they really you know coding and have they shipped left? Um, so making that making a determination of what shift left what shifts left and ensuring that our partners in those development organizations um, are prepared and, and ready for that. Um, and, and I'd actually like to uh, hear Ryan's uh, approach on that because I know he's done a lot of work there. And then when it falls within our core areas to ensure that we deliver you know, these new job functions, we, we change our models and, and we go into the parts of the organization that already has them or um, those part of the industries that can provide them and, and immediately attack them to be able to start that mm -hmm. pipeline. Yeah, excellent, Ryan. Yep. I'll follow yeah, up there. I, maybe <clears throat> this might be somewhat controversial, but at its core, I don't think security is as special as a, of a field as we have collectively come to believe it is. Um, and what I mean by that is it, it's a younger discipline in the technology field than many of the others that um, like pure software development have existed for decades longer. Um, but at its core, it's a risk management function and it's a quality engineering function. And I think because of the, the newness of security relative to these other disciplines, there's more and more for us to gain by learning from and adopting for, uh, the practices of solid software engineering at scale, solid product, product development and management at scale. Um, then from uh, focusing learning and development on um, always trying to, to, to chase the new shiny, which I think is the, the path that a lot of both leaders and individual contributors get sometimes pulled into. Um, of course, keeping with emerging skill skills and technical domains is very valuable. Um, but speaking for myself, I can say I've, I've probably learned more as both an IC and then as a, a security leader from working with amazing engineers, with working with amazing engineering managers and working with amazing product managers that weren't actually security people. They did not know anything about security as a domain, but had practices and disciplines that security desperately needs. 
And I think as we're maturing and learning to work effectively in especially large organizations with these partner teams, that is the foremost skill that security teams need to up-level themselves, to be able to not necessarily center on this idea that security is special. We need all this extra stuff that's just for us. And instead say, well, you know what? Like we're security, we're working with teams focused on performance, reliability, availability, all these other domains of quality. Um, and we should work together in the same ways and learn in the same ways and manage and demonstrate and measure ourselves in the same ways. Um, and I think there's just a lot of, a lot to gain from that and a lot of great, well-worn educational paths that, that people can follow to learn some of those skills. Um, and so when I work with and mentor folks, that's what I always recommend. So, so you know I think this is a really go ahead, go ahead, Renee. No, you know what else I think I would do because there are some specialty skills. You know, I, I would almost also make a list of things that we're not going to try and do for ourselves, you know, that will just be outside our swim lane. So, for example, you know, if, if the company had had a ransomware event, like I wouldn't expect anybody on my team, nor would I want to, to try to negotiate with them. Right. So yeah. almost make a list of things that, that you're not going to bring inside. Right. So that has to stay away. And then some other yeah. things probably are are need to, could be, you know, leverage from people outside. but you know, what is it that your core team really needs to be do, yeah. needs to be able to do to support, you know, the risk management activities and some of the IR activities, you know, that, that will impact your business and then yeah. go yeah. get that, I, you know. I, and I, yeah, I, I think I, you I bring think up. A, a, go ahead, Richard. No, I think you, sorry, Cut. I, I think you bring up a really interesting point. I think this is anything with any kind of new technology. Um, there's the adoption phase and everything else. There's a hundred companies that are telling you how to adopt AI and NL and what's best for your organization. I don't know if you believe them because they're not in the organization at all. So I think there's some issues of what people are doing. And then in organizations, where do you go start? And I think this is part of the thing, especially with Renee's comment is that I know what I'm not doing what is the world of IT or supply chain or what are they not doing as well? That should be across the organization so that I don't take on ownership because it's one of those things. Security ends up owning things that they have no business in owning simply because somebody said they're going to take care of it. And then you open the door and there's nothing in the room. <laughs> and you're like, how are you taking care of this? If there's nothing here, you just said you're taking care of it. <laughs> so I think you really have to do. And one issue, especially for this year, any of these new technologies, you've got to get your, your your developers and everything else trained or certified. And with the macroeconomic headwinds that we're going to be approaching, you everyone that's done this for a while knows the first thing that is cut in those budgets is training on that side of it that's there. And it, and And you're not going to be able to do that moving forward anymore. That's not the, oh, this is good if we have... No, you're going to be, we're going this direction and we need people that are going to be that. And if you decide not to do to, hey, we lost this person, how am I going to replace them or any of those other things? If you're not spending money directly on the people that do this or and enable those technologies, you're you're losing money every single day that goes on on that side of it, because there's no way to get ahead. You have to start and start developing and start doing that rather than, hey, guess what? June one hits, guess what? It's time to do this. And they were like, we have no training. We have nothing. We have no idea how to en actually enable this mm -hmm. or where we're going to start. And that's a problem. So since you mentioned money, Richard, let, let's move to our last question. Uh, and then I want to uh, have some time uh, to answer some questions. This has been a great discussion. Uh, but how do we increase the effectiveness of our cybersecurity program? How do we lower that overall, you know, how do we increase our overall protection, uh, increase our incident detection and lower those costs in 2023? Uh, because organizations are going to be challenging us uh, just like every organization to lower costs in, in our business line. So Ryan, why don't you start us off with that? What are your quick thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great broad question. I'll, I'll just touch on one of what I'm sure are many, many things. Um, and that's, ways that security can forge better partnerships with the teams that they depend on. Uh, and I think that comes from building more trust and showing partner teams that you can use their time more efficiently. Um, I talked earlier a bunch about like that partnership between security and engineering teams, be it app developers or infrastructure owners. 
Um, and, you know, among the things I've seen that really help is um, one, aligning incentives. So um, when you look at the, the value of security work, you have to quantify it. And that's always super hard. One of the many ways you can approach that is um, by focusing your security metrics gathering on looking at incident retrospectives and churn generated from dealing post facto with security issues that were preventable and using that to make compelling points, hopefully about the time and the inflection point where it's a worthwhile investment to, on the front end, work on preventing security issues that are fixable um, versus on the back end, pulling teams into incident response, um, extending on calls into a unsustainable state, pulling engineers away from productive work to deal with um, putting out fires. Um, those are things you can quantify and, and like measure year over year and used to justify like inserting security along with the myriad of other priorities that are taking teams times up quarter by quarter. Um, and the second is I think to maintain that trust is to show that you're being good stewards of time by prioritizing well. Um, I think one of the traps a lot of security practitioners fall into is um, a sort of absolutism that like if a solution isn't 100% perfect, then it's not worth engineering. And so um, being willing to both prioritize and meet in the middle and accept that getting a team to agree and align on an 80% solution um, brings you in a far better spot organizationally than spending years and years to chip away at a 100% solution that you never get close to achieving and in the process burn bridges because people get frustrated with what you're asking being unrealistic um, or excessive. Um, and so, yeah, building that trust, building um, uh, that collaboration, meeting teams in the middle, I think are the key way that security scales beyond the 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 walls of what a security organization on its own can ever support or do. Renee, what, what do you take from your experiences of what we should be doing today? Yeah, first let me get off mute. I think that this is as good a time as any to go back in and look at what you've already done and whether it's still, you know, doing what you think it's doing um, in light of all the changes that have happened with um, COVID and cloud and, and maybe do a little bit of house cleaning. If there's something there that probably hasn't really ever made it off the shelf, then think about, you know, maybe it's time to let it go and part with it. So that's some of the things that I hear people doing this year is that they're just going back in and doing a bit of um, inventory. Um, but I also think that this is probably a good as good a time um, to focus in on some processes that I think probably need to be up leveled in light of um, a lot of things that happened in 2022, especially the incident response program and making sure that there's a good governance program, good handoffs, who, that people know who are making decisions. So, um, so they're not losing time, you know, because time is also money and time, the longer you wait sometimes on an incident, right, the worse it can get. So I think you can create some payback by just cleaning up some, making your incident management or incident response process more effective and, and doing some, uh, you know, some tests of it across the organization to make sure you don't, you know, cost the, the organization more money than it should because you haven't, you haven't got a good handle on that. So sure. those okay. are some and of the things Richard, I would be doing. Richard, what's the one thing that you would do right now to become more Ask for a raise. <laughs> Ask for a raise. You know, I there said you go. Reduce, it's all about, it's all costs. about me. Reduce costs. No. Uh, so I think one of the things that goes in um, on a lot of things and everybody echoed the same thing, but I think it's one of the things that if you look at architecting and building uh, your security program modular and replaceable and things around that, your network stack should be, I don't want this component, I can swap it out for maybe a component that may be cheaper, that is lower cost and everything else. And we try to shy away from that because we're all like, we're all, I'm trying to get my vendors down to five. And I'm like, you're going to pay a lot more for things when you try to focus in on one organization than you try to do on the other side of it. So you got to figure out your battle, whether or not you just want to manage 30 vendors or whether or not uh, you want to do something. But in those opportunities, if you're fixed and immobile, you're, it's going to be painful uh on that side of it that's there so i can guarantee that you're going to see organizations on a typical 10 to 20 percent uh budget cut for probably going through this year and it'll be two on that your initial one and then one later in the process on that side of it that's there 
Um, so it's going to happen and you better be prepared for it and thinking about it ahead of time. Because yeah. if you're not thinking about it, when they go here, you got you got five days to figure it out. We need an answer. That's not the time to go figure out what do we use? What do we don't use? How are we going to do this? Do we need more licenses? Can we rationalize these applications? Yep. That's not the time to do it. So you got to do it right now. Right. So Roland, what, what, what's the number one thing that you would do to become more effective in 2023? Know what my business cost me. I, I think everyone talked about it and around it, but at the end of the day, um, what services I'm delivering, what do they cost me? Um, and how do I prioritize them? Where else can I get them? Right. That that's not done, you know, to, you know, uh, Rick's kind of perspective, it's it's not done overnight, right? Like this is a um, this is a detailed thing that you need some help with. Work with finance. Mm -hmm. If you have a finance person on a team, awesome. Most people don't. So go find someone, um, tell them security sexy and, and bring them into the fold. And if you haven't got, gone through the services that you deliver back to your company um, and, and what it costs, inclusive of the technology, as everyone was saying, um, do that. So you have a, a ROM on, on what it costs you to deliver it, prioritize it, and then have procure, work with procurement to say, is there a better way to do this or not? You know, maybe you come up to a certain area, you know, when, when you're having these budget discussions and you come up to it and that's below the line. We're not going to be doing that service. Um, but when you when you orchestrate in, your, in a mindset that says I'm delivering a service to the business for a reason to achieve the mission and the business objectives they have. And in order to do that, I provide these services and each one of these services cost me X. Then some of that will be peanut butter spread with FTE and things like that. You're going to have to make judgment choices. But the reality is you can get to a fairly reasonable number and just be prepared to have the discussion as a business executive driving protection programs for your organization. That's your responsibility. And a lot of time we focus so much on the IR and so much on stopping bad stuff from happening and all of that. We don't take the time to do the business aspects of our business. So I would focus. Mm -hmm. on. Great, great insight. Uh, let's let's get to a couple questions. Uh, real quick answers. Uh, and then we will we will have a final wrap up. Uh, let's take this question first. Uh, in cases where countries restrict movement of data to within the country itself, what are some potential solutions for such an onerous burden? Roland, I know you've done some work in that area. Uh, you want to? Yeah, it's been my through? life. It's been yeah. my life. Listen, uh, I think Gartner calls it DSPM now. Um, I even forget what it yeah. what it, it, it it stands for. Data. Data security posture management. And what all this means is that there are technologies out there that consolidate having to have six or seven different technologies really down to like one or two. Um, a lot of times we had uh, something to find data and then we had to classify it and tag it and so on. Like the basic things you need is where's my data? Um, uh, what, what are my major data repositories? What's in it? Um, and who has access to it? So, so I think if if you can just answer start to an, have a mechanism by how you are going to answer those three things and, and and fixate yourself in the dspm area a little bit to find those companies that can help you get that accomplished i think that's important great let's take one more question before we uh, have a final wrap up uh how should enterprises prefer prepare for the new sec rules that increase accountability to the 8k report and naming leaders Uh, so I'll take a quick stab at it, but I, I think everyone has a voice on this. If, if we think about it, there's only a few things that they're asking for is incident disclosure um, and, and how that's going to be matured. Um, uh, a review of policies and ensure that's done at the highest level and inclusive of how uh, the board understands them and their role. Um, oversight structures um, and dedicated directors uh, to cyber. Like, like that's super high level. Like, like I'm not a legal expert mm -hmm. by any stretch of my imagination. Mm -hmm. um, but what I will tell you is that many, many companies have already gone down this route. So I think working with your general counsel to say, here's what they're asking for, and here are the elements of what I think is changing. How do we meet that? Or how do we already meet that so we can reasonably articulate it? Um, and whether it's in your Qs or your Ks, I think um, being able to align that to answering the risk question, which most organizations do already from an SEC perspective, um, and there's already and there's a pathway. I don't think it's going to be as catastrophic as it sounds, except for those companies that don't do anything in this space. Um, what I would say is have a plan for what you don't have. 
um, in, in work with your secretary of the board or your general counsel to, to help develop that posture and show them, you, you know, you're working ahead of, of it becoming an emergency. Great. Yeah, and that's why I, I said what I said. I'd go back and review my, my, my plans for managing an incident, disclosure, all of the above, and making sure that they were you know, that they've been updated recently and they've been updated with legal and there was proper role sort in this whole thing. Any other thoughts? Any last thought? Okay, let's let's have one, one final thought as we're moving into 2023. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, give us your 30 second outlook. Uh, as far as, you know, what's that last piece of advice that you want to leave people with today? Renee? I'll start maybe with uh, causes for optimism, uh, since security always tends to be so doom and gloom. Um, I think we have a, a nice recent history of showing that, like, good design um, can massively improve security outcomes across the board. Um, I think the most recent example of that is phishing-resistant authentication, um, which is finally reaching a tipping point with WebAuthn uh, integration and support across all the major OSs, uh, with the release of pass keys across all major OSs for tokenless um, uh, fish resistant uh, authentication. And I think um, it will be one of uh, what has been, I think, a series of, of technologies that has removed or at least significantly mitigated an attack surface that has plagued us for quite some time. So I'm excited to see that type of thing continue. and. Um, I think we need to continue investing more in those secure by default, secure by design platforms to um, raise raise security for everybody. So I think COVID actually showed us that we can move uh, quickly uh, and and uh, in spite of adversity. And I think that for many of us, that was a feather in our cap. And so even though there's all this doom and gloom right now, I think it behooves us to think about the success that we've had in the past and, and even, you know, and try to, to lead maybe more positively and think about the health and well-being of our staffs. Now, I, I, I think from my perspective, people are your most precious resource, so is time. Just always remember that, that people cannot work 24 by 7 unless you've got a bunch of AIs and everything else and they're not doing their job most of the time. So. Look at it on the honest side that people and that time is eight hours and look at the time that people are doing and the burnout is critical, but also it's a good measurable. It's time. Everybody gets it. So if I say it takes 280 hours to do something, it's 280 hours to do something. If you're going to cut me 80 hours or cut my people, it's going to take longer or I lost a person. So now it's more inefficient or the same thing is we're working on two projects and I can't split people and you have an incident response or anything else be sure to track it we came across ideas of tracking what's good is great take ownership of that but also what failed and why did it do it the root cause analysis and be sure to bring that up so that it you don't have to come back and we like we had three of these and both all three failed one after another why is that um you figure it out understand why it's there it could be your issues could be some other person's issues, could be part of the COVID work from home, dedicated stuff. All those things are new and they're gonna take time to figure out, but you have to figure them out or they're gonna come back and hit you every time. Yep. Roland, 30 and, seconds, bring us home. Uh, all right, well, I'm with Ryan. I mean, there's so much awesomeness going on in this field right now. And it's such, it's gonna, you know, this is gonna be a positive year. You have an amazing opportunity to change your business and, and really help drive the business. Find out what your business needs of you based on their strategy and, and create your top 10 list, the top 10 things to help achieve each one of those parts of that strategy. And for yourself, create your top five list, the five things you need to do better to be a better business executive to support them. And, and I think that'll help you have a great year. I think that's all great, great perspectives. Uh, I'm just going to add to this. I think that we should all be networking. We should all be collaborating. We should be learning constantly. Go to those sessions. You go to the next conference. If there's a topic you don't know anything about, that's the session you want, you want to go to, not the ones that you know things about. Um, expand your own knowledge. Um, this 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 uh, podcast, uh, this will come out as a podcast and a webinar uh, on the CISO Stories uh, website. 
uh, please go there, listen to plenty of other podcasts. Uh, uh, each of our uh, guests have recorded podcasts uh, on different topics, uh, 20, 25 minute podcasts. Uh, and thank you from the Cybersecurity Collaborative where we're bringing CISOs together to help this community uh, in a uh, non-biased way and in a way that brings real experience to the table. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.